Let's start the final session in this weekend retreat, uh, session eight, titled Compassion in Daily Life. So we've gone through all the various compassion practices now in terms of the four immeasurables as the basis, how to deal with anger and attachment, and then in terms of building on the four immeasurables with the exchanging self with others and the Tonglen practice. So that brings us now to this last session. So in this last session, we'll begin with another Tonglen meditation, the one we just did in the last session. We'll follow that with a little bit of a summary of some of the main points in this weekend retreat, have a brief look at uh, bringing compassion into daily life, and then a little bit about how we can set up our day to support this practice. We'll do another Tonglen meditation time for some question answer and then at the end just a short preview of the two upcoming Vipassana retreats and then we'll finish with a dedication for the week this weekend's retreat. So let's start with another Tonglen meditation. As with loving kindness and compassion we do this in stages so in the last Tonglen meditation we started with ourself moved out towards a friend now we'll go to the next stage. We'll start with a stranger, someone who we know well, but neither a friend nor uh, someone we dislike. And then we'll go out from there. So let's do that practice uh, now. Let's begin now. So finding a nice, comfortable posture. Let's begin that meditation. As always, we begin by preparing the body, finding that nice, comfortable posture, back straight and body relaxed. And relaxing more deeply with each out breath. Breathing flowing naturally and effortlessly. And allowing the mind to come to rest in the present moment. And we begin the Tonglen practice by imagining the inner purity of our mind as a small white radiant sphere of light, 
in the center of our chest at the level of our heart. And then bring to mind someone who you know well, but is neither a friend nor someone who you dislike. Particularly someone who's currently having some sort of physical or mental problem or suffering. And then arouse the thought, how wonderful it would be if they were free of that problem, free of that suffering. May you be free of all suffering and its causes. And imagine their problem or suffering in the form of black smoke filling their body. And with each in-breath, imagine drawing that black smoke out of their body and bringing it into the sphere of light at your heart, completely dissolving it there. So with each in-breath, breathe in with compassion, dissolving and extinguishing their suffering at your heart. Imagine now the black cloud is completely extinguished and now they're completely free of that problem, free of that suffering. And take delight in this. And then arouse the thought, how wonderful it would be if they had happiness in its causes. May you be truly well and happy. And with each out breath, imagine rays of light radiating out from your heart, filling their body and mind and transforming into everything they need to be happy. So with each out breath, breathe out the light of loving kindness, sending to them whatever they need to be happy in the short term, and the long term. And then imagine they've now found the genuine happiness that they seek. And take joy in this. And then allow your field of loving kindness and compassion to expand out further. 
and allow your mind to move around. And whoever comes to mind, whether it's a friend, a stranger, or even a difficult person, attend to them. May you be free of all suffering and its causes. And may you be truly well and happy. And breathing in with compassion, dissolving and extinguishing their suffering at your heart and breathing out the light of loving kindness, sending to them whatever they need to be happy. Allow your mind to continue to move around, whoever comes to mind, whether it's an individual or even a group of people, attend to them, breathing in with compassion, breathing out the light of loving kindness. No matter how much darkness is drawn in, it is all extinguished without a trace. And no matter how much light is sent out, it is sent out from an inexhaustible source that is in no way depleted. Breathing in with compassion, breathing out the light of loving kindness.
and then release all appearances and allow the mind to come to rest. To rest in that inner purity of mind, which is in the nature of loving kindness and compassion. And we can bring the meditation to a close. Let's begin with a summary of some of the main points in this weekend retreat. As we have seen a number of times now, the two main wings of practice are wisdom and compassion. We're looking at the compassion, we've been looking at the compassion wing of practice in this weekend retreat. The two next, the two uh, weekend retreats coming up, uh, looking, we'll be looking at the wisdom wing, the Vipassana practice. And here in the compassion wing of practice, the foundation for this is the four immeasurables. Often in the Theravada Buddhist traditions, these are called the four Brahma Viharas. And we are cultivating these towards immeasurable, in, term, in other words, in, towards all living beings. Loving kindness, compassion, empathetic joy, and equanimity. And we saw there that loving kindness is the wish or aspiration for ourselves and others to have happiness in its causes. So therefore it's better to use the word loving kindness than love in this context. Because love for us normally implies, means it's emo, emo, an emotion and often implies some sort of be intimate behavior. Whereas here is loving kindness is this is not an emotion, it's an aspiration, it's a wish. And if we want to cultivate this loving kindness for ourselves and others, then we really need to know what is happiness, what are the causes of happiness, and how do we cultivate those causes? Otherwise, this is simply words with not really much meaning. And we looked there at the two types of happiness of pleasure and inner well-being and not to confuse those two types of happiness and not to have craving and attachment for our pleasurable experiences, hoping that they will simply give us some sort of lasting, meaningful happiness. And to really let go of that craving and attachment to thereby understand that there is this state of genuine happiness of inner well-being that we can achieve. Um, through these three higher trainings, through the practices of ethics, concentration and wisdom, on the basis of ethical lifestyle, developing single point of concentration, and then engaging in the wisdom of a Pashana practice to come to realize the nature of reality, an insight into nature of reality, thereby overcome our distorted view, our ignorance, and thereby overcome mental afflictions and suffering and achieve liberation from suffering. And that liberation is this state of genuine happiness of inner well-being. And so therefore, we, if we appreciate that, we can then strive for this state of genuine happiness. And at the same time, we can actually enjoy pleasurable experiences more than we normally do. And then by knowing these three things, then we can really start to cultivate loving kindness for ourselves and thereby through cultivating loving kindness for ourselves, then we will inspire us to actually strive in creating those causes for happiness and, and achieving that state of genuine happiness. And then having loving kindness for others, we can also then inspire us to help others to achieve that same state of genuine happiness of inner well-being. And similarly with compassion, which in Pali and Sanskrit is karuna, Again, compassion here is not an emotion, it's a wish or it's an aspiration uh, for ourselves and others to be free of suffering in its causes. And so if we really want to cultivate compassion, we need to know what is suffering, 
what are the causes of suffering and how do we eliminate those causes? And so here we saw that this word suffering can have a much, it has a much broader meaning than normally we understand the word suffering. That this word to be free of suffering here means to be free of dukkha. So not only to be free of unpleasant experiences, but to be, and, to the, and also to be free of attachment to pleasant experiences, but at the deepest level, to be free of the potential of suffering to arise in our life. And to be free of that, we have to eliminate the causes of suffering, and they are the mental afflictions, particularly here, the three poisons. And so by eliminating these mental afflictions, we can overcome all suffering. And so therefore we can cultivate, through cultivating compassion for ourselves, then we would strive to eliminate suffering and its causes. And by cultivating compassion for others, we would then help others to do likewise. An empathetic joy um, was to really, again, it's a wish or an aspiration, and it's really focusing on the positive aspects of ourselves and others. Something very important for us in the modern world where we tend to have this obsessive focus on the negative aspects of ourselves and others. And so empathetic joy can really help it uh, help us to achieve that balanced view of ourselves and others, to focus on the positives. And again, when we're doing this, to avoid this cognitive fusion, to not mistakenly identify ourselves and others with even our positive aspects, because otherwise we'll simply uh, be, if we're praising ourselves and praising other people, there's a chance then we'll just simply develop a, it'll be a bit of an ego trip and, and, uh, we, we uh, boost the ego. Um, so rather to have a correct perspective and to really to praise others behave, good behavior, praise our own behavior and rejoice in that. Um, and that can help us to have this balanced view of ourselves and others to focus on the positive aspects. And then equanimity is really the foundation of the other three to really uh, overcome equanimity is to really help us to overcome attachment to friends, apathy to strangers, and aversion to difficult people. And to develop this sense of closeness to everyone, understanding that we're all equal in wanting to be happy, wanting to be free of suffering. We're all in the same situation. And therefore, on that basis, then we can really cultivate the immeasurable loving kindness, compassion, empathetic joy. And then we saw that we can, particularly in the Mahayana Buddhist traditions, we build on those four immeasurables to the next level, the level of bodhicitta. We didn't really look at bodhicitta in any detail in this weekend's retreat. It's a little bit beyond the scope of this retreat. But what we did do was to look at one of the two methods for helping us to cultivate bodhicitta. This method of exchanging self with others, which is can be very, um, helpful for us in the modern world, even if we're not aspiring for cultivating bodhicitta, because this exchanging self with others is directly targeting the selfish, self selfish, self-cherishing mind, which is tends to be very strong in our modern society. And so by uh, going through these five points, that can really help us to uh, reduce and exchange our selfish self-centered attitude, which is really the source of suffering. Uh, even though uh, on the surface, it may seem like it's our best friend bringing us happiness, but as we saw in the Shanti Deva quote, and as we find out if we reflect on it closely, that actually this selfish self, me first attitude is really just going to bring us, bring us suffering and the people around us suffering. And so going through these five points of first equalizing ourselves with others, then reflecting on the disadvantages of this me first attitude, this selfish attitude, the advantages of cherishing others, and thereby uh, inspiring us to, uh, motivating us to then exchanging the, the selfish self-centered centered attitude with an attitude of cherishing others, to do that in daily life. And then also the med that meditative practice of Tong Len now that we've done a couple of times, to really uh, boost that process of transforming attachment and aversion into loving kindness and compassion. And so that brings us to um, compassion in daily life. 
And so here in terms of the loving kindness and compassion, we saw there that it's very much recommended that we practice this in stages, that first we practice this toward ourselves uh, to really uh, to cultivate, uh, to be kind and compassionate to ourselves first, because without that, we won't be able to extend that out to others. And then on that basis, then to cultivate loving kindness and compassion to our friends, because most easy, and then moving out from there to strangers, difficult people, and then eventually towards all living beings. Now, in terms of those four immeasurables, you know, often in meditation practice, we see that four line verse. Uh, and often people simply recite those four lines. May all living beings have happiness in its causes. May they be free of suffering in its causes and so on. And so it's easy to, for, to say that, to, for that to roll off the tongue. May everyone be free of suffering. May everyone have happiness. Um, but except, of course, that horrible, nasty person at work. <laughs> so therefore, to really make that practical in daily life, this idea of all living beings, then in a practical sense, all living beings for us in daily life is simply everyone we meet and even everyone we think about. So whenever we come into contact with someone, either physically or mentally, then we can do this loving kindness and compassion. May you be free of all mental afflictions and suffering. May you be truly well and happy. So that can really help us to expand this out to all living beings, is to really have this aspiration for everyone we meet in daily life. May you be free of suffering. May you be free of mental afflictions. May you be truly well and happy. And to help us to do that, remember, particularly for the difficult people, to really avoid that cognitive fusion. Because if we um, see people as bad people, nasty people, then it's going to be almost impossible to cultivate loving kindness and compassion for them because we'll feel like they don't deserve it because they're such a horrible person. But again, technically speaking, we can say that there's no such thing as a bad person. There are only people who sometimes do bad things. And so if we can adopt that correct perspective, distinguishing person from behavior, then we can really start to cultivate loving kindness and compassion even to the difficult people. In fact, if we make that shift away from cognitive fusion to the correct perspective, you'll find that it will naturally become more instinctive that when we see uh, a, a person engaging in harmful behavior, that rather than instinctively getting angry at them, we'll find that by adopting the correct perspective that will more instinctively have compassion for that person seeing that that person is just creating a lot of suffering for themselves and others and we'll have compassion and then we'll do whatever we can to try and help that person to overcome that negative behavior and then this tong len practice that we've done is really um, a synthesis pretty well of all the four immeasurables we saw that the um, compassion on the in-breath loving kindness on the out-breath the rejoicing, having released, uh, found the genuine happiness, having got rid of suffering, the empathetic joy, and then equanimity is also built in there as well. And this Tonglen practice, um, we can apply it very well in daily life. In fact, once we've done, we've learned this practice well, we can do the entire practice on one breath. And so we can do this Tonglen practice all day long to help us to cultivate loving kindness and compassion for others. So whenever we see others suffering, obviously, if, they're, if it's obvious that they're suffering either mentally or physically, then take that suffering from them and give them happiness. But of course, this is not a substitute for actually helping people. You know, We shouldn't be thinking, oh, I'm so kind and compassionate because I'm doing to, Tong Len to people all day long. When in, when at the same time, if there's an opportunity to help people, we don't help people, then I think this Tong Len is a little bit of lip service. It's not really genuine. If we're really genuinely doing this in daily life, what you will find is that if we do actually have the opportunity to help people, then we'll actually help people. So it's not a substitute for actually help people. This is for helping people. This is actually to increase loving kindness and compassion so that we will 
help people in a more genuine way in daily life. Also, we can do this when we ourselves are suffering. Uh, let's take a concrete example. Let's say we're having a migraine headache. Now, often when we have such sort of suffering, and maybe we, uh, our own experience is that even if we take medication, it doesn't really help then often when we have these sorts of sufferings arise, we go, oh, no, not that again. Go away, go away. I don't want this. And so we just simply develop a version when we have some, particularly some physical and even mental suffering. And all that aversion does is it magnifies our suffering. So therefore, the first step we can do is practice what's called acceptance. And acceptance doesn't mean resignation. Acceptance simply means acknowledging in the present moment, I'm experiencing this uh, physical or mental suffering. And then we can follow Shanti Deva's advice. If we can fix the situation, if the situation can be remedied, just fix it. If it can't be remedied, what's the point in getting upset? That's acceptance. So if we're having a migraine headache, practice acceptance so to stop the aversion. Because all aversion does is it magnifies suffering. And if we, by taking medication, it can resolve it, take the medication. If we know from our own experience it doesn't help, then go, okay, nothing to do. It'll eventually pass. So that's the first step is acceptance. But in addition to that, we can make that difficult situation meaningful by using that situation to cultivate loving kindness and compassion, particularly for others and ourselves. So for example, this migraine headache, if we're having the migraine headache, then we can say, well, okay, there must be thousands of other people on the planet at the moment who are having migraine headaches and maybe much worse than me. So my, by me willingly accepting this migraine headache, may all others be free of theirs. And so take on their migraine headaches and then send them happiness. So then we can use that difficult suffering situation to avoid the aversion, but also make it meaningful to cultivate loving kindness and compassion for others. And what you will probably find as well is because now we're focusing on others, then with compassion, that often tends to overwhelm, uh, to subdue the suffering that we experience. So you may find that that even lessens the suffering further. At least it will avoid increasing through aversion. But we can make those situations, uh, difficult situations that we are experiencing meaningful. And then also what we can do is when we're meeting difficult people, again, to avoid the cognitive fusion. And then if we are meeting someone and they're uh, having a lot of, they're reacting in not a very good way, then take their mental afflictions from them and then give them happiness. And we can even do this as a preparatory step. If we're about to say, go into a, meeting or a situation where we're anticipating that we're going to react in a negative way because maybe they're going to be a little bit aggressive or something, then as we're approaching them, we can do this. Take their mental afflictions, give them happiness. In that way, we won't be on the defensive with aversion. We'll be open with loving kindness and compassion. And so when they say something um, aggressive towards us, rather than reacting with anger, we're more likely to respond with loving kindness and compassion. So these are some situations where we can apply this Tonglen practice throughout daily life to really deepen loving kindness and compassion, to really reduce this selfish, self-centered attitude, to increase the attitude of cherishing others. And so then how can we set up the day in a good way? So I think very important, very helpful, at the beginning of the day, set a good motivation for the day. And so here, based on these four immeasurables, um, here's a short motivation that uh, we, we can, we've got from His Holiness Dalai Lama, who says, every day, think as you wake up, I'm going to benefit others as much as I can. So I think if we start the day with such a motivation, that's a, a wonderful way to start the day. And then in terms of a daily meditation practice, best thing to do that first thing in the morning uh, where we're most fresh and focused and a good way to start the day. And uh, it's very helpful here to start with a bit of shamatha practice to really calm the mind, to focus the mind. And then if we have time as well, 
to then, based on what we've been doing this weekend's retreat, is to do something from the compassion wing of practice. And here, as we've seen, the Tong Len is a very good practice that covers a lot of the bases within the compassion wing of practice. And in doing a Tong Len practice in the morning, what can be very helpful is to be very specific, particularly about specific people or situations that we're likely to encounter that day. And so that can be very helpful as a, also as a preparation for us encountering those people and those situations through the day. Um, as I've mentioned earlier, very helpful to have an integrated approach to our meditative practice to cover all three bases of shamatha, of the compassion wing and the wisdom wing. So far in this weekend, we're uh, looking at the compassion wing. So I'm mainly focusing on that here. In the next two retreats, then I'll bring in some ideas from the wisdom wing that we can integrate here into meditation and into daily life as well. But here, mainly, mainly we'll talk about the compassion wing. So then we need to bring whatever we're meditating on into daily life. So uh, therefore, it's very important, as we saw in terms of dealing with anger and attachment and mental afflictions in general, is to cultivate that mindfulness, is to really have mindfulness throughout the day in terms of witnessing, observing whatever's coming up in our mind, observing these mental afflictions rather than simply getting caught up in them and reacting. And so if we can simply observe them, then when we're faced with difficult situations in particular, then rather than reacting with attachment, aversion, jealousy, and so forth, we can respond with loving kindness and compassion. And as we saw, to really avoid this cognitive fusion, to not identify ourselves or others with habits, with behavior, with emotions and so forth. Because if we do, then we're simply going to judge, criticize, attack and so forth ourselves and others. And then as we mentioned briefly earlier as well, what can be very helpful here, particularly again, when we're dealing with difficult situations, difficult people, um, is to shift perspective, is to not simply have this perspective, how is this situation affecting me? Because then we're more likely to react with aversion to unpleasant people and situations and attachment to pleasant people and pleasant situations. Rather have a broader perspective, a second or third person perspective if we're dealing with other people. How is this other person seeing this situation? Or even better, uh, as a third person, how the situation between us and the other person is unfolding. In that way, then it's more likely that we will be able to uh, respond in a uh, effective way through loving kindness and compassion, rather than again, reacting with attachment, aversion, jealousy, and so forth. And then as we just saw in the previous slide, throughout the day, we can do this Tong Len practice. Whenever we see anyone suffering, take their suffering, give them happiness when we're suffering, take other suffering, give them happiness, and also when we're faced with difficult situations. But also very important, as we saw with empathetic joy, is focus on the positives. So similarly, whenever we see ourselves or we see others engaging in virtuous or good behavior, getting good results, to really have joy, to rejoice in that to really focus on the positives of ourselves and others throughout the day, to get a balanced view of ourselves and others. And then we saw earlier also at the end of the day, then what can be very helpful here is if we have time, of course, to engage in a second meditative practice. So if we're planning to do two meditations in a day, then what can be helpful is to do the shamatha practice in the morning, um, to really help calm and focus the mind with a good motivation. And then in the evening, maybe we're a little bit more tired than to do something a little bit more active, such as a Tong Len meditation or Vipassana meditation in the evening. But at least what we can do, as we saw earlier, is that before we go to bed, is to review our day. How did our day go? And then pick one good thing we did during the day, one positive thing during the day. And again, this rejoicing in that action and then making a strong determination to continue that good behavior the following day. In that way, we can increase our positive um, um, habits. 
Likewise, then pick one negative thing, one not so good thing we did during the day, and then go through these four opponent powers we looked at, these ways to purify the mind of these negative habits. First, have sincere regret for having done that negative thing. Then reaffirm the positive direction we want to follow in life. Third thing was some practical remedy for doing against that. And the fourth thing, make a strong determination not to do that negative thing again. In that way, we can weaken negative actions, negative behavior, negative habits. And then lastly, again, to help us to have gratitude for all the things we get in our life is to pick one thing which we receive during the day and develop and have a sense of gratitude for having received that thing. And so if we do these three things at the end of the day, I think that's an excellent way to finish the day. So that's a little bit about setting up the day. So let's go back to the meditation practice again, the Tong Len practice. And so now we'll just continue to expand out further. So if you'd like to find a nice comfortable posture, let's begin the practice. setting the body into a state of relaxation, stillness, and vigilance. And relaxing more deeply with each out breath. And with each out breath, letting go of any thoughts that may have arisen, happily releasing them. And allowing the mind to come to rest in the stillness of the present moment. and imagining the inner purity of your mind as a small white radiant sphere of light in the center of your chest at the level of your heart. And then allow your field of loving kindness and compassion to expand out to include everyone following this weekend retreat. And arouse the thought, how wonderful it would be if everyone were free of suffering in its causes. May you all be free of suffering in its causes. May you all be free of the mental afflictions. and imagining everyone's mental afflictions and suffering in the form of black smoke filling their bodies. And with each in-breath, imagine drawing that black smoke out of their bodies and bringing it into the sphere of light at your heart, completely dissolving it there. 
So with each in-breath, breathe in with compassion, dissolving and extinguishing everyone's mental afflictions and suffering at your heart. And then imagine everyone's now free of all mental afflictions and suffering. And take joy in this. And then arouse the thought, how wonderful it would be if everyone had happiness in its causes. May you all be truly well and happy. And with each out breath, imagine rays of light radiating out from your heart and filling everyone's body and mind, transforming into everything they need to be happy. So with each out breath, breathe out the light of loving kindness, sending to everyone whatever they need to be happy. And then imagine now everyone has achieved the genuine happiness, a state of inner well-being. And take delight in this. And then allow your field of loving kindness and compassion to expand out further and allow your mind to move around. And whoever comes to mind, whether it's an individual or even a group of people, attend to them. May you be free of all suffering and its causes, and may you be truly well and happy. Breathing in with compassion, breathing out the light of loving kindness.
and then release all appearances and allow the mind to come to rest. Resting in that inner purity of mind, which is in the nature of loving kindness and compassion. And then we can bring the meditation to a close. And we have some time for question and answer before we slowly wrap up this weekend retreat. So if anyone has any questions, now is the, it's your last opportunity to ask questions for this retreat. Mikkel. Hi, Glenn. Thank you very much Hi. for one weekend. Sure. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I couldn't be here all day, so uh, excuse me if you already answered this, but um, when we do the Tungalan practice, I have a bit of worry about, you know, uh, <laughs> energetically, um, you know, absorbing all this black smoke and what happens if you don't kind of deal with it decently, you know. Um, is there any kind of like mental imagery or something that you can recommend that make sure that it's really transformed? You know, yeah. I, I do get the sense of seeing people more joyful after and being able to see them more compassionate, happy. So is that in itself a kind of proof that, has, that I've done the work or, you know, yeah. you know, yeah. do you have some recommendations for that? Sure. So a couple of points there. First is that this Tonglen practice is a mental exercise. So it's not like uh, Reiki or, or it's not some energetic work. We're not shifting energies. You know, there are other things like Reiki and so forth where they, you manipulate energy. So here in Tonglen, we're not doing that. So there's no energy transference. It's, it's purely a mental exercise. So that's the first point. And secondly is, as I mentioned in the earlier session, is... Um, I think that there are a number of ways we can do this practice. The one we did is the one I prefer, and that is to, with the, and you don't have to, you don't have to imagine suffering as smoke or whatever. That's just visualizing to, to help make it more powerful. But whatever you're visualizing or imagining, not to then to hold on to it, because that's this cognitive fusion. So we are, again, the symbolism here, the way we're doing it, is that that white light in the center of our chest is the inner purity of our mind, it's our inner wisdom. And so by imagining taking that smoke, which is symbolizing mental afflictions and suffering, it, it is in taking it into that, it's completely dissolved because it's the wisdom which dissolves the mental afflictions and suffering. So it's not like we're taking that and holding on to it. So whatever mechanism you use, it's important that we're not somehow holding on to that whatever it is smoke or whatever we're visualizing that that's just the the want the willingness to take on other suffering is that is what is dissolving the selfishness and we're dissolving that suffering in and the mental afflictions into that inner wisdom so that's the symbolism so we're not trying to hold on to it so we just do it in that way so i find that particularly helpful. But again, the visualization is really secondary in this Tonglen practice. Some people don't like visualizing, don't find it helpful. Um, the main thing is simply wanting to take the suffering away from others and wanting to give them happiness. That's really the key. But again, when we're taking suffering, not to then say somehow hold on to it ourselves. then we're not doing the practice correctly then that's another form of this what's called cognitive fusion does that sort of help or is there something more to your question 
uh, yes, it helps because that's kind of what I do. Like I imagine it, and then when I breathe out, I feel like this white light coming out and just diffuses the the smoke yeah, or exactly. whatever. So, so I, again, I so the yeah, yeah, we're not trying to hold on to it. We're just um, we're dissolving it in this case into that inner wisdom, into the to, to the light. Whatever mechanism you use is not then to just hold on to it because that's then where we're identifying again with others suffering as opposed to our own suffering. And so that's not the practice and that's not helpful. But I am, um, I'm, <laughs> I'm still wondering, you, you said to begin with, it's not an energetic practice. How can it not be? I mean, I'm How sorry for asking this. It's, but a, it's, like it's, it's a mental exercise. I mean, what can happen, of course, is that in the process of mentally wishing to take the suffering and give happiness, physically, we could have something happening in our body, but that's relative to the, our mental state. It's not, that physical thing happening in the body is nothing to do with the other person. We're not taking their energies or anything. We can't do that in this practice. I mean, through other things like Reiki, you can manipulate energy, but we're not doing that in this practice. Okay. Okay. Sure. Someone else, I think someone put the hand up. Who was that? I didn't catch. Yes, it's Whoever was Jesus. next. Hello. Sorry. Is it? Cesare. Yes, I have another question. So sure. uh, soon uh, I should start working as a um, secondary school teacher. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would like some kind of uh, tips for practicing Tonglen uh, with the classes. As I tried to do it in the past, I noticed also like in general situations, I tend to get tired or distracted. Uh, I had the intention, I, I, you know, doing this lesson, I'll practice, you know, and then either something happens and then I get completely distracted or maybe I get tired and, and then, yeah. yeah. Maybe, um, maybe that also related because one thing I noticed is that as I do it, sometimes, well, most of the times, I tend to change the rhythm of my breath. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's, um, there can be a tendency because we're, con we're conjoining this with the breath. There can be a tendency to thereby intentionally or unintentionally manipulate the breath. So we don't want to do that because that's probably not going to be very helpful if we're sort of, you know, taking a deep, deep breath and holding the breath and so forth. So just, just breathe naturally. And, and the, the breath is just to help us to stay focused. Um, and you don't have to conjoin this with the breath, but you, you generally we find it a little bit easier to stay focused if we're conjoining with the in-breath and the out-breath. So we don't really want to be playing around with the breathing in this exercise, in this particular mental exercise. And just sort of make it, um, don't get very tight on this, you know, don't, just very, very easy. And if you're sort of doing it in the class, I think, again, uh, don't do it for long periods of time. But, you know, for example, if you see one child having some problem, then on one breath, simply take that problem, and give them happiness, finished, end of story. So just keep it, keep it very light and don't sort of tense or push on it. I think that can be very helpful. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, any other questions? I think someone else maybe put their hand up at some point. No, no more questions. Okay, then if there's no more questions, I'll go on to I've got one or two more points to cover. Um, so just the preview of the upcoming retreat. So again, this weekend, we are covering the compassion wing of the practice. And in the next two weekend retreats, we'll go into Vipassana. And the foundation level of the Vipassana or wisdom practice are these three marks of existence. Uh, impermanence, suffering, no self. So in the next weekend retreat, we'll be looking at those and we'll be using this sort of classic approach we often find in the Theravada Buddhist traditions of these, what's called the four applications of mindfulness that will be investigating the body, 
our feelings, the mind and phenomena in general, to come to cultivate these three insights of impermanence, suffering, and no self. And the recommended reading for that weekend retreat is this Minding Closely uh, from Alan Wallace. This is a Vipassana book on, on, the three, on the four applications of mindfulness. And then the following, the, la the following retreat, the last Vipassana retreat, will go into the emptiness practice. So that's building on these three marks of existence. So that is to come to realize emptiness, to come to realize that everything's empty of independent existence. Nothing exists independently, that everything is what's called a dependent arising. Everything's interdependent. And within that weekend's retreat, in terms of the actual emptiness practices, we'll be focusing on two sort of alternate strategies to do the emptiness. First, a classic approach of looking for the emptiness of a person. Where is the me here that seems to be here? To come to realize emptiness with respect to me, the person. And then another classic approach we often find in Dzogchen and Mahamudra systems of practice in Tibetan Buddhism is investigate our own mind. Where is this mind that seems to be here to come to realize the nature of our own mind? So we'll be looking at that approach to emptiness practice as well. And the book I recommend for uh, emptiness practice in general as a beginning stage is this How to See Yourself as You Really Are from His Holiness Dalai Lama. So they're the two Vipassana retreats that um, are up and coming in, in three weeks and in six weeks time. And so then let's just now um, finish with a dedication to dedicate all the efforts that we've uh, put together over this weekend's retreat. And this is one of my favorite dedications. It's coming again from this great Indian master Shanti Deva and some uh, dedication verses. And so I'll read out the dedication verses. You can also uh, read them out uh, as well, or you can just sit there quietly and and reflect on the words as I read them out. So uh, either option is is fine. So I'll I'll just read through the dedication now and dedicating all of our merit, all of our efforts uh, for this weekend's retreat um, using these verses here from Shanti Deva. May all beings everywhere, plagued by sufferings of body and mind obtain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of my merits. May no living creature suffer, commit evil or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittled with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food. May the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth, those weak with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, May they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be freed. May the powerless find power and may people think of benefiting each other. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain to dispel the miseries of the world. And so that then now completes this weekend compassion retreat. So I hope you got something out of this retreat and uh, look forward to seeing you in three weeks time for the first of the two Vipassana retreats. We'll be focusing on these uh, three marks of existence. So until then, stay safe, stay well. Thank you and see you in three weeks time.